quite a bit of material here, but momentum as a topic goes is not particularly complex. But it is important that we understand that it's not energy right now. We're going to be talking about something a little different. So this topic is impulse and momentum. And we're also going to be talking about what it means to be part of a system. So there's the basic definitions here that you guys should have had from middle school. I don't know whether any of that kind of stuff sticks or not, but I want to start by saying that Newton actually formulated all of dynamics based on momentum. So his version of Newton's second law and his version of, of almost all of physics is from the standpoint of momentum, not the standpoint of a point mass that has velocity. So the way we tend to do things here and the way we tend to describe physics isn't the way he described it. But that being said, momentum is a very fundamental measurement, maybe more fundamental than anything else. Momentum is a measure of an object's inertia while moving. It's a measure of an object's inertia while moving. Momentum is a more powerful measurement than what we've been doing so far. For example, momentum will take into account an object whose mass is changing while it's moving. It has more characteristics, but it also describes something for us that an object's inertia isn't just about its mass. Remember, inertia is how much an object resists changes in motion. So an object that's small can still have a lot of inertia as long as it's moving fast enough. I'd argue that bullets have a lot of inertia. They are difficult to stop or to change. And therefore, they have a lot of inertia. They don't have much mass. But because they are given such exceptionally high velocities, they are difficult to change or alter. Thus, when we talk about momentum, it's hard to have a conversation that doesn't involve inertia since they are intimately linked. Now, very specifically, momentum is a vector quantity. Unlike energy, it has direction. So when you're measuring something's momentum, it is different than measuring energy. Energy had an extra emphasis on velocity. Momentum does not. It gives equal footing to both mass and velocity. But it takes into account what direction the object is going, which means we're back to figuring out what positive means. When you're dealing with the motion of an object, you need to probably establish what direction you're going to call positive because its momentum is, has a direction. And the direction of the momentum is the direction of the velocity. No special units here. It's kilograms, meters per second, and no special name is given to that unit. What is fundamental here is that Newton's second law was actually created to deal with momentum, not acceleration. When Newton put together his law, he didn't have M.A. as Newton's second law. He said that an unbalanced force would cause a change in momentum. In fact, he said that the net force was the rate of change of momentum. Now, we're going to cycle back to the second semester. First semester, we'll just make this delta P over delta T. That's a little bit easier. So although they have similar meanings, we'll kind of forget I said that and equate these two things together just for the time being. And the reason is I want to multiply both sides here by delta T. So although Newton's second law is what started most of this, in most physics books, they introduce the concept of impulse. This is the impulse relationship. Impulse isn't just one thing. Impulse has a cause and an effect side. The left side is the cause side of impulse. The right side is the effect. If I ask you to calculate the impulse, Either side will do. Let me point this out. If you're asked to calculate impulse, either side will do. It's kind of like the work energy theorem, where you can calculate the work done by calculating the change in kinetic energy, or you can do force times distance. Here, I'm giving you a similar thing, but for momentum. 
when I ask for the impulse, I'm asking you to either calculate force times time, or I'm asking you to calculate the change in momentum. They mean the same thing. But this is where things can get a little bit hairy. My coffee cup is not perched precariously at the edge of my table. But would we all agree that if my coffee cup were to be knocked off the table, it would likely shatter on the ground and you guys would have a bad day? Do you agree with that? Yes. Both statements, shattering on the ground and you having a bad day. So I want you to think about something for a moment. Third period was unable to picture this, but perhaps you guys will. My coffee cup right now is about a meter and a half off the ground. So here to here is about a meter and a half. On the table here, if I drop it, I, I'm pretty sure it'll, it'll shatter. But what if I, you know, carefully put a, a pillow here? Slide it right under the coffee cup before it hits the ground. Is the coffee cup as likely to shatter on the side with the cushion as opposed to the side that's just the hard floor? All right, so in asking this question, I'm not trying to trick you, but I am trying to trick you. On which side, the left or the right, would the cup experience the larger impulse? The one on the left or the one on the right? We agreed it's probably going to shatter on the left, but it probably won't shatter on the right. Now, anybody who had physics last year, you, you shouldn't answer this. You should know the answer. This, one is, this is a simple, simple thing. But people who have never had physics before, they're trying to work this out. They're trying to work out what it is I'm actually asking. And they don't want to get it wrong. Can we agree that in both cases, the cup's traveling about the same speed when it hits the ground? Can we all agree that in both cases, the cup's going to be brought to rest by the ground or the pillow? So the change in momentum is the same, whether the cup lands on the pillow or the cup lands on the ground. The change in momentum is the same, which means the impulse is the same for both. The cup breaking isn't about impulse. The cup breaking is about change in momentum. The fact that one breaks and one doesn't doesn't speak to impulse. Impulse is only concerned with how much the momentum changed. And the momentum will change the same, whether the cup safely lands here on the pillow or shatters into a thousand pieces on the floor. In both cases, the change in momentum of the coffee cup is the same. So the impulse is the same. One of them shattering and the other one not shattering speaks to the cause of that impulse, not how much impulse there was. It takes more force to shatter the coffee cup, which means likely the coffee cup on the left experienced more force than the coffee cup on the right. Why? Because the pillow, the pillow made it take longer to stop. And because the pillow made it take longer to stop, the force required to stop it was less and likely won't break the coffee cup. But because the pillowy softness of the floor took less time to stop the coffee cup, that force had to be greater. How many of you wore your seatbelt on your way to school today? Well, it should be all of you if you were, of course, in a car. Now, if you're on a school bus, apparently we've decided you don't need seatbelts because seatbelts are just there for you to whack somebody in the head with that's next to you. So we've removed most of the seatbelts on buses. So you're just at the whim of that big cushion in front of you. But if you were in a car today, especially if you're in the front seat, there are your options to stop, right? You get in a car accident and the car were to stop suddenly. You could be stopped by the pillowy softness of your dashboard. You could be stopped by the, the elastic nature of your seatbelt. Or you could be stopped by the pillowy softness of the airbag that explodes in front of you. Now, not to make a, a, a joke of this, but which one would you prefer? You're going to be stopped either way. I mean, there is a fourth option that you are ejected from the vehicle and you slide to your stop. I would argue that that one takes the most time 
and the least amount of force. But it leaves a streak, and people don't like that. So the belief is the safest way to stop is securely in your car, right? That's what we tend to think. Dashboard really isn't pillowy soft, right? That's a little bit of sarcasm. The dashboard will stop you in a tenth of a millisecond. Seatbelts stop you in milliseconds. Airbags stop you in tens of milliseconds. And do the math on that. Between tens of milliseconds and tenths of milliseconds is a hundredfold difference. If I can make it last a hundred times longer to stop you, you experienced one one hundredth of the force. That's why airbags are so good at protecting people. They make it take hundreds of times longer to stop. Seatbelts are in the middle. Seatbelts take milliseconds to stop you. You get a tenfold reduction in the force compared to the dashboard. That doesn't mean it's nice on you. Have you ever tried to stretch your seatbelt? In a car accident, it'll stretch up to two inches. I want you to think about what that means. If you can pull on it, you probably don't stretch it, do you? But your body will hit it with such force that it'll cause it to stretch up to two inches. That's why seatbelts have to be replaced after a car accident. They are no longer able to stretch. Now, what's interesting is that most of the time, the biggest contributor to saving your or protecting your person in a car isn't any of those three things. Today's cars are built with amazing abilities to absorb impact by compressing the car first. Crumple zones on cars are the first thing to slow the car down. They make the accident take upwards of hundreds of milliseconds, which is a thousand fold increase from the dashboard stopping you by itself. Look at a car from the 1950s, then look at a car from the 70s, then look at a car from the 90s, and now look at a modern car and look at the progression. A 50s car had a metal dashboard and a steel frame and steel, steel, uh, steel door panels and fenders and stuff. It could get into a 20 mile an hour collision and you wouldn't even see a scratch on the car. That meant you would probably die inside the car. There was no seatbelts. You were stopped by the dash. 50s cars were death traps because you would stop it. Everything in the car would keep going. Today's cars, 20 mile an hour collisions, probably $4,000 worth of damage. But you will probably have, not have a mark on you which is why a 50 mile an hour collision you can walk away from. Cars are amazingly safe today compared to what they used to be. So all of it's about increasing how long it takes to stop. That's what the cars do. It's like an egg toss. How many of you have ever played an egg toss game because your parents hate you or a water balloon toss game? That one's a little more fun. That's only like four of you. Really? None of you have played the stupid water balloon toss game. Raise your hand if you've never played a water balloon toss game. Okay, so I have people in the room who didn't raise their hand for either one of those. That means you're not listening. Because you either have played it or you have not played it. It's the idea where you take the water balloon and you toss it to your friend. And if they successfully catch it, you take a step back and they throw it right back at you. And your job is to try and see how far apart you can get while still safely catching the water balloon. There might be a prize at the end of this. Probably not. Just stupid church picnic bragging rights, probably. Did you all catch it the same way? Did you hold your arms out there stiffly and let it just hit you in the arms? No, you waited for it and you did a, one of those. Why? You made it take longer to stop. By making it take longer to stop, it decreased how much force was necessary to stop. It probably wouldn't rupture the egg or the water balloon. It's like boxers. You ever watch a boxing match? Not ultimate fighting. It's not the same. Boxers dance. And ultimate fighting, they just bludgeon each other. But boxers dance. Watch a boxing match. Watch what they do. They're bobbing and weaving and they're coming back. Why? Because if the punch is going to hit them, they're going to allow the punch to make contact but make it take longer to stop by leaning backwards. That's how a boxer fights. It's about a dance. It's an art. Take a punch and reduce its capacity to hurt you by increasing how long it takes to stop. Now, Mr. Miyagi would probably say you just don't want to be there. That's karate kid but your job of course is 
it's to, you know, as, if you're going to have to take a punch, is to reduce its impact. Increase delta T so that you can reduce the force. Notice, in all cases, the punch is going to stop you. In the car accident, the car and you are going to stop. The effect of that impulse is going to be the same. You're just trying to manipulate the cause. This is a conversation about impulse. So I don't really want to talk too much about it. You can plug numbers in here. I can tell you that an object went from five meters per second to two meters per second. And you can figure out things like how much force there was. If I tell you the whole thing took one second, that, I'm not going to do that kind of plug and chug. Find impulse. I'll tell you what chapter it is. I'll make five of those problems where you can just plug and chug those answers through so you can practice. The only example I wish for you guys. So here, here's an example. A ball is thrown at a wall. It contacts the wall at 45 meters, 45 degrees at an angle of five meters per second. Bounces off the wall at 45 degrees at a speed of five meters per second. Can you calculate the impulse imparted to the ball by the wall? I'll give you 60 seconds. Calculate the impulse imparted to the ball by the wall. And because of the interest of time, you guys who have never done this before, the answer is not zero. I know the ball hit the wall at five meters seconds and bounced off at five meters per second, but the answer is not zero. Remember, momentum is a vector. So I'll wait patiently. I want to give, because you either know how to do this and took off and did it, or you probably didn't. The answer is about 3.5 kilogram meters per second. So if you know what you're doing, you know how you got that. If you guys don't, then let's follow along with what had to be done here. First, do we all agree that the ball experienced a change in velocity? Speed stayed the same, but the direction changed. So there was a change in velocity. So let's start with that. I'm going to identify this direction as being positive. I'm also going to establish this direction as being positive. This is a two-dimensional problem. Now, there is a component of the ball's momentum in this direction. Did that component change? If you don't know what I asked, then we have a problem. But do you realize that the, this component of the momentum is 0.5 times 5 sine 45 degrees? And that over here, that same component would be 0.5 mass times the velocity, 5 sine 45 degrees. That didn't change. That component was upwards both times. That part of the momentum never changed. But there's also a component of the momentum this way. Mass, 0.5. Velocity, 5, cosine 45. After it bounced off the wall, that momentum was now in the opposite direction. Negative 5, cosine 45. So it had a change in momentum because the direction changed. When I go to calculate the impulse, that's going to be P final minus P initial. I have to take the direction into account. So 0.5 times negative 3.5. 5 cosine 45 is about 3.5. Minus 0.5 times 3.5, which in this case gives me negative 3.5 kilograms meters per second, which means the impulse was to the left. Impulse has direction. The impulse is to the left. I think some kids are screwing around. Generally running down the hallway suggests screwing around. So the wall pushed on the ball to the left. And this is the size of that change in momentum. Questions about that? 
That one's pretty straightforward. It's also supposed to identify all the problems that you'll make. You'll forget about direction. You'll not know to change this from uh, 45 degrees to two components. I'm hopefully handling all of the little things that I would expect you to be able to do on a problem like this. Also, something else I want to point out. The wall experienced an impulse to the right. Newton's third law still happens here. The wall pushed on the ball to the left, but the ball pushed on the wall to the right. The ball was in contact with the wall for the same amount of time as the wall was in contact with the ball. So the impulses had to be the same. So Newton's third law works for impulse just the same way it works for force. All right. I will also point out how much work was done in this problem. Zero. Energy doesn't have direction. The ball had a speed of five meters per second before contacting the wall and a speed of five meters per second after it contacted the wall. The kinetic energy was the same, which means there was no work done on the ball. So impulse and work tell us different things. You can't conflate them and you can't assume they're going to be equal. All right. Provide you some practice with this. None of it particularly hard. This is the level of impulse you will have to be able to do for the test, the semester exam. This is not the level of impulse you'll have to be able to do for the AP exam. Does everybody understand? I want to add something to that. So we're going to change things a little bit to talk about systems. Momentum is a conversation that really lends itself well to discussing a, sim a system. A system isn't anything complex. It's just more than one object. That's what makes a system. So we talk about a system. It could be anything. It could be a collection of billiard balls on a, on a pool table. It could be the air molecules in the room. It could be the bumper cars at the, uh, at the Bush Gardens. It could be the cars on the road. It could be, you know, particles at a nuclear accelerator. A system is defined by you to include the objects that you're observing. But when we talk about systems, there are measurements and features we need to be aware of. First, the air molecules in the room have a certain amount of energy and have a certain amount of momentum. Now, we could talk about the momentum of a system and the energy of a system. It's not hard. The energy of a system would just be the sum of the, en of the individual energies. And that could be lots of different forms of energy, but the total energy would just be the sum. In chemistry, we've learned that the energy of the air molecules in the room is proportional to its temperature. And we would note that the molecules of air in the room constitute a system, and that system has a certain amount of energy. We can do the same thing for momentum. But it's a vector sum. So we can talk about the vector sum of all the individual momentums. That would be the total momentum. I'd argue that the momentum of the air in the room is zero. It stays in the room. Collectively, the air molecules are not all moving to the east, which is good for all the people around the west side of the room, right? We wouldn't like all the air to suddenly go that way if you're sitting over there. We expect that that won't happen. But we would say that the momentum of the air in the room is zero because although they're all moving, they're all moving in such a way that they're contained. Contained in the room. We would say that the total momentum of the system is zero. Now, my, my coffee cup, as it falls off the table, there's lots of molecules that make up the coffee cup. And as it falls off the table, all of those molecules are moving at the same speed as it falls to the floor. 
we generally can think of the coffee cup as a single object, but it's not. It's a system of objects. They just all happen to be connected together. Back to work. Um, so far this year, when we've had a system of objects, we've identified that we can just take that object and isolate it to a point, and we can call that point the object, right? Every free body diagram has taken whatever our object is and reduced it down to a point. Our system needs to be a little bit more aware that objects have extension. So reducing it to a point might not always be as easy as that sounds. So I need to introduce a topic known as the center of mass. Center of mass is a concept that allows us to figure out where the center of an object actually is, assuming that that center is based on mass, not volume. So the understanding being that we've been looking at the middle of an object as being its center. What if we want to know where the heaviest part of the object is? Center of mass is like that. I mean, consider a simple example. This is not a difficult concept, but I need you to kind of be with me on this one. So let's consider I have four objects. Four objects, all on a, in a line. And let's say the size of the object is proportional to how massive each object is. If I connect all these objects together and say that there are one object, where would you tell me the center of mass of the system is? Like if I was to just put the pointer here and kind of move, do you think it's gonna be over on this side or over on this side? So the right side or the left side? So we think it's gonna be over here someplace. So closer, like maybe would here work? Would that maybe be where the center is? I'm not asking you to know it for, for sure. Just trying to get an estimate. Maybe it's um, more like here. How do you think it's more like there? Is that okay? You want me to make it more obvious? You know, we're just going to pick some place that we think it is. I'm going to say it's right there. That that would be the center of the object. If I was to try and balance the object on a pin here, it would balance with an equal mass on each side of the object. The first thing I wanna point out is, if that's true, if it would balance right there, we would call that point the center of mass. And I'm saying this because here's what you guys don't understand that I need you to. Center of mass is a place, it's a location. If I ask you to calculate the center of mass, I am asking you to tell me how many meters it is from somewhere. Center of mass is a position, it is a location. In three-dimensional space, the center of mass is X, Y, and Z. So to find the center of mass, you have to start by saying, where is zero? And you measure it by measuring a distance away from a reference point. So center of ma mass is a place, it is a location, it's somewhere in the object, I hope. It's not always in the object though. There's plenty of objects that have a center of mass that aren't in the object, like a donut. Right? The center of mass of a donut isn't in, the, isn't in the donut, it's in the hole in the middle. So the center of mass isn't necessarily where the object is. It's just some place that defines where the average mass of the object is. That's what the center of mass calculates, where the average mass of the object is. It's actually a super simple calculation. For these four objects, we start by needing to know what their mass is. Then we need to know how far away they are from our, our point that we're calling the origin. So I, I'm saying that there's gonna be four different distances. There's really only gonna be three because one of my objects is on the origin. But I have to know how far away each object is from a fixed agreed upon reference point. Now calculating the center of mass, that part's easy. It's a weighted average.
and it's probably been a while since you guys have done weighted averages, if you ever did them at all. The top is I just take the product of the mass times how far away it is from the reference point. All of these R's though are vectors. So if you have mass on both sides of the reference point, you'll have to make some R's positive and some R's negative. But then you have to divide all of this by the total mass. This would be where the center of mass is. So again, it is a location and it is a vector. Now, this is in your equation sheet, but it's written different. This is how you write it for an equation sheet. You write it as a summation. And you guys are going to hate this, but you mathy types will love it. For a continuous object, like finding the center of mass of your table or box or coffee mug, you may have to do an integration in order to find it. And if it's in three dimensions, you'd have to do three intervals, one for each dimension. If it's a summation, you have to do it at least one in each dimension. All right. The bell is going to interrupt us here in just a minute. But tomorrow, we need to take this idea of center of mass and apply it to a system of objects that's moving. I want you to think about this for just a minute. What if R is changing all the time? Right? What if these objects are moving in different directions? That would mean that the center of mass is also moving. Now, that might not seem like much, but I'm running out of space here. That's all right. We'll, we'll get this tomorrow.